I'd like to begin this episode with a very simple premise. We need to build systems that embrace failure. This is something we at AWS keep in mind when we design and build our infrastructure and services. I'm delighted to be joined for this episode by Stephen Quigg, known as Squig, a senior principal security solutions architect. Thanks for having me here, Rob. You may be wondering, why have I asked a security person to be in a video about resilience? Resilience and security go hand in hand. Resilience is a subset of security, and you can never be resilient unless you're secure. So what we want to talk about today is some of the innovations that we've developed while operating AWS for nearly two decades. And we thought the best way to do that is by taking you on a little tour of one of our data centers. So let's imagine we've just arrived at the doors of a data center. Oh, hold on. You can't just turn up at an AWS data center. Oh. You need to have an actual business need. You need to be approved by the data center security manager. Do you have that approval? I don't. Right, okay. Let's quickly sort those approvals out in the background and we'll pretend that that process is completed and you are now allowed to turn up at our data center. Okay, so let's imagine we've done that and we've turned up at the doors and we go in the doors. You've been in one of the data centers. What is it like? The first place we're going to go is the plant room, it's the power cooling equipment that maintains the power and the environment within our data center. And the first thing we see there is the power supply comes into the data center. Now, we've talked about our regions having multiple availability zones. Each availability zone in the region has its own power supply. So if there's a failure of power at a substation level, that power failure would never impact the other availability zones within the region. So the power comes in and the first thing that happens is it goes to the switch gear. The switch gear is the large equipment that can handle these very high voltages that come in to the data center. And from there, we go into our uninterruptible power supplies or UPS systems. And these are the systems designed to protect the data center's power in event that the external power supply fails. So say there's a problem, the voltage drops, a power cable is cut, for example, by a building works. Then the UPS system maintains the power using first of all its own batteries and then by handing over to the diesel generators that can run continuously to supply the data center with power. Now, a story I really like is how we customize the software in the switch gear that performs that handover process. So the handover of power to the generator is controlled by the switch gear equipment and the switch gear manufacturers design this to protect the generator which is a large piece of equipment upwards of three quarters of a million dollars. These are huge things and there's typically more than 10 or 15 of these per data center that we have. The switch gear will decide when to turn the generator on, but in certain rare circumstances, it might decide that the electricity supply could damage the generator. We decided that we wanted to be in control of that process. So we contacted the switch gear manufacturer and found that they all work like that. So the only way for us to take control would be to put our own code into the switch gear to change the way that it worked, to protect the running customer workloads and keep your mission critical services up and running. I think it's a really good innovation story. And you see that where we take control of the decisions that are made by equipment and they run our own code so that that code we can update at a time that's right for us, that meets our needs, is something that permeates many things we do. So we've spoken about how power comes into the data center, but another critical part supporting your application is the network. Well, the network is the thing that allows our customers to connect to the cloud. It's also the thing that connects the cloud itself together. It's the connectivity between all those racks of equipment that we have. So first of all, we have the Amazon Backbone Network. This is a global private network that we operate with fiber optic cable carrying all of our data around the world. We've installed now more than 5 million kilometers of fiber optic cable. That's enough to the moon and back six times. Within each AWS region, we also have this fiber optic cable connecting our data centers together and connecting our availability zones. We have many paths so that we connect in what you would call a mesh network, so that if any cable is cut, so for example, a utility team go through a cable in the street, these are common types of failures, that will not interrupt the resilience of the network that our customer is relying on. So another important requirement for resilience is the capacity of that network. So I work with global banks and they want to be sure that when they're running their mission critical applications across multiple AWS regions, that there's enough bandwidth or capacity between those regions to support those applications. One of our innovations in the network was we looked at the density of the fiber optic cables that you can put together. And we decided that we could design 
more dense cables, which allows us to carry higher amounts of bandwidth through those bundles of fiber optic connections that connect all of our data centers. But it's no good if the network is resilient, if our customers can't reach the network. And they don't have to connect over the internet, they can connect privately to AWS using our direct connect service. These are physical places within each AWS region that our customers connect to so that they can connect their data centers privately, this doesn't need the internet, and resiliently to AWS. And when our customers connect to our direct connect points, from that point onwards, they're on the Amazon Backbone network, giving them all of this resilience and bandwidth that we have. And we're constantly improving the bandwidth of that network. It's doubled in uh, bandwidth since 2019. And that network is encrypted as well. Yes, every time any network leaves Amazon's physical control, we always encrypt those network connections. Customers typically choose to run their own encryption on top of that as well. So encryption is important, a big concern for our customers. And another area where we want to encrypt is in the storage. So let's continue our journey into the machine hall. So once we're through the plant room for the data center, we come to the most important part of all. These are machine halls. This is where the services that run AWS are composed. So access is even further restricted there, I'm afraid. But let's assume that we get through those access control procedures and we're now in the machine halls full of the servers, racks, which compose the AWS services. So the first thing you might see is the top of rack switch, which is connected to the routers. And are, they, are these commercial routers? No, all of this is equipment that we've designed ourselves, that we have manufactured from us by multiple different suppliers. All of this equipment's running our own code. When you buy network equipment from a vendor, then you're at the mercy of that vendor to provide the updates, to do the functions that you need. At AWS, we decided that we could build our own much simpler devices in many cases, but they're running code that we develop ourselves so that when we want to update that code, it's exactly the same software engineering processes that we use for everything else at AWS. Nice. So tell me about some of the innovations in the actual AWS servers. So we launched an Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2, back in 2006. This gave customers the ability to run their own virtual Linux or Windows server in the cloud. Over many years of operation of that service, we decided we wanted to offer it more resiliently and more securely. So we rethought the hypervisor and we created the AWS Nitro system. This took many of the things that we needed to do in the hypervisor and moved them onto our own custom hardware that runs in that server, freeing more of the CPU up for our customers. And tell me about the security side of that as well. Well, the great thing about Nitro is that because it's our own hardware running our own code, the Nitro security chip can make sure that all of the code working on there is present and correct. It also allows us to encrypt all of our customers' traffic at a hardware level before the traffic and storage would ever leave that server. So I really like the innovations that we were able to bring to customers based on the Nitro system as well. So once you've moved the hypervisor from the main server onto the Nitro card, you've now freed up all of that server that you can uh, give to our customers. So we were able to launch bare metal instances, for instance, where you could give the entire server, the whole central processing unit can be given over to one customer to use. Another example of the innovation is we were able to take a Nitro card and plug it into the back of an Apple Mac mini computer and then offer our customers Mac instances also protected by the Nitro system. And on the security side, we're able to dynamically update the code that runs Nitro without interrupting the customer workload from running. We can do it at any time, which means we don't have to offer our customers maintenance windows. And some of our customers many years ago may have remembered occasionally AWS would send them a notice saying, could you please reboot your Windows or your Linux server, for example, because we need to perform updates. Not anymore. We don't have to do that anymore. So as you've hopefully just seen, by walking through the virtual data center, the scale of this research and innovation, which informs so much of the AWS cloud services and operations, goes beyond anything that most other organizations could do and always keep security and resilience in mind. So the outcome of this innovation is that AWS is the most resilient cloud for your mission critical applications. So thank you Squig for joining me for this episode. Thank you Rob. In the next episode, we'll dive further into AWS global infrastructure. See you there.